Good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us for February, our February edition of Cecil Coffee Talk. Uh, thank you all very much for uh, joining us this morning. Uh, my name's Sean O'Brien. I'm the president of QuickRate. Uh, and like you, I am uh, also a director in the National Bank of St. Anne in Illinois. And so we are dealing with Cecil. So, you know, again, as we go through this, I think, you know, I'd like to think that we not only come to you as a provider of a CISO solution, but also someone who is actually preparing it. So we're, you know, facing the same challenges uh, that you are, and we've tried to address those with our, with our CISO solver. Uh, I am pleased as always to be joined on the presentation uh, by Steve Huntington. Steve, I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for joining us today, everybody. My name is Steve Huntington. I'm the director of analytics uh, here at Quick Analytics. I've uh, been uh, spent my entire career working with uh, community banks and credit unions, uh, helping them build financial models and doing um, other types of analytics. And I've been working with Sean for a little over uh, a decade now, I guess, um, trying to bring those analytical tools uh, to you guys in a in a much more clean and concise manner. Thank you, Steve. Uh, okay, so, you know, why are we here today? Again, uh, our thought as we entered uh, this, you know, final year before the uh, implementation of CECL, we have a number of uh, users. We thought it would be helpful to kind of check in every month, maybe address topics that you might be concerned about or have questions about, uh, use it as a way to introduce those who have not yet begun the process. Uh, just a little bit about what we're doing here at Quick Analytics with our CECL solver. Uh, and again, make it a, a forum where you could bring questions uh, every month uh, to, you know, to try to help ensure uh, that this you know, transition to CECL becomes kind of a non-event. That's really our goal, right? We built the CECL solver to assist you, but we also want you to know beyond just the one-on-ones we can have, you know, there's a forum, you know, a user group, however you want to kind of characterize this that will be here to assist you as you work your way uh, through this, this transition. Um, so the format we're using here is a little bit different. If, you, uh, if you've tuned into Quick Rate or Quick Analytics webinars in the past, uh, typically we're in presentation mode, which means uh, you, know, you can hear us, but we can't hear you. But this time we'd love for you to engage. So you, know, you can certainly uh, you know, ask a question. Uh, most commonly people typically raise their hand or go through the chat function. Uh, but we'll monitor that through the, the presentation today, uh, and then we'll take those, uh, you know, uh, either during or just towards the end of the of the presentation today. We're going to touch touch on a, a couple of topics, um, and then uh, again, uh, we'll be monitoring questions as Steve kind of takes you through uh, just a real brief introduction of our Cecil uh, solver, uh, and then we talk a little bit about the scale tool, and then also. Today, we're gonna to talk a little bit more about Q-Factors. So those are kind of the three topics we're gonna to address and we'll kind of get right into those. So Steve, take it away. Yeah, so thanks. Uh, as Sean mentioned, just a, a quick brief overview of, of how our tool uh, works for any of you who are not familiar with it and haven't seen it before on any of our previous webinars. Um, when you first log into using our Cecil solver, it's pretty much preloaded with all of your and your peers' historical financial data um, by segment going back um, pretty much to the beginning of time. Um, the idea with our tool is that right out of the box, you have actionable results with just a handful of inputs and assumptions. Uh, when we dig into the uh, historical analysis tab here, uh, you'd see that uh, it's pretty much preloaded with loss data, balance data, by segment um, for you and for however you wanna build your peer group. Cust uh, peer groups are completely customizable. And um, the first step is, is we do some average remaining life calculations because we're heavily utilizing the, the warm or the weighted average remaining maturity methodology for our CECL tool. It's one of the, certainly one of the more straightforward and no nonsense approaches to CECL that's been vetted and approved for community banks to, to utilize to comply. Um, after we kind of take into a deep dive into your historical trends and use those average remaining life calculations to sort of inform our look back periods, then the second half of the CECL tool is all about the fudge factors, right? It's all about those qualitative factor adjustments, internal and external in nature, that help us estimate uh, the, the, you know, the accumulation of all of them estimates how we think current and future conditions might be a little bit different than what we've experienced in the past. 
Um, the way our tool works is very interactive, so it's easy to build scenarios. And what I mean by all that is whenever you change an assumption and an input, the entire tool recalculates on the fly. The historical data recalculates, the peer data recalculates, the CECL reserves by segment, all of it pretty much um, recalculates on the fly. Um, as you can see here, um, this is the summary tab, and we can dig into the details with the historical tab. Um, there's a place for you to manage your individually assessed loans separately. Um, there's a separate tab where we can dig into all the intricacies of the peer data and how that peer data can be really critical and helpful in our, um, in our Q factor um, um, part of the tool. And then finally, we give you a little module to help you navigate the unfunded commitments as it's a relatively small piece of the puzzle for most people when it comes to Cecil, but it is something that's on the call reports and they're gonna be asking you to establish a separate pittance of an ACL separately just for the unfunded commitments. And so we help you walk through that as well. Uh, next slide, Sean. Um, the other thing, just to let you guys know kind of how you'd manage our tool, um, as, you, as you, know, you save scenarios right here on the tool, everything is saved in the cloud. So there's nothing for you to download and install onto your own um, systems. We give you pass logins and passwords and everything is saved right here uh, on the cloud. You save scenarios at will, build a repository of different reserve analyses over time so we can demonstrate to our uh, regulators that we are, you know, we're calculating it, we're doing it in parallel, we're following it and tracking it as we go through this year and get closer to our implementation date. And certainly you can, um, you know, when you have a scenario as you like it, you can export as much or as little of the detail as you'd like, depending upon your audience for, for exporting the tool, whether it's a summary to your board or all the really uh, granular historical and peer data for your auditors. Um, and you can export it to a PDF or to an Excel file um, with a single click. And um, it really just provides a very clean, kind of no nonsense approach to uh, to managing Cecil from cradle to grave. Sean? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the first thing, uh, we've been getting lots of questions about, um, about the scale model. Um, you know, the Fed came out with this mid-year, uh, was it July? Um, or Ju June or July of last year. Uh, and they kind of just put it out there and left it out there. Um, if you can go to the next slide quick, yep. Sean. Um, some of the issues, you know, we looked, we looked at the tool, we discussed it with the FDIC um, and FASB, and um, while it certainly presents a, a, what might, a simple solution to, to Cecil, um, when, when you look at it a little bit more deeply, you know, some of the concerns that we had in, in analyzing the, the, uh, the Fed scale model was that while I'm sure to some extent it was developed with, in conjunction with the FDIC, it is not a safe harbor methodology, nor is it what they call a regular preferred method. Um, it's something the Fed is not necessarily, um, they pretty much said they're, they're not really going to maintain the tool and they're not going to be consulting on its use. So it's presented on an as is, take it or leave it type basis. Um, it's, it presents a pretty simplistic or limited view of, of uh, loan segmentation. Because it doesn't even, you know, our tool utilizes all the available call report data and segments um, when it comes to tracking loan loss history at the segment level, um, going back um, further, you know, a, a lifetime type uh, duration into the into the past, and then out extrapolating those expectations out into the future. Uh, whereas the scale tool is sort of limited to the the data that we can get, not from not from all of uh, Schedule RCC, right? Our whole loan um, loan portfolio segmentation, but only what we can get in Schedule RIC, which is uh, specifically um, the the disaggregated loan loss reserve data that the FDIC has been starting to collect on larger institutions, specifically institutions that are over a billion dollars in assets and are starting to to um, to comply with Cecil. Um, so what we decided to do, we thought the, east, the, the best thing for us to do was to pretty much rebuild um, the, the scale tool and present it as an alternative to, uh, to our CECL solver right in our interactive format. Um, so instead of sort of fighting against it and arguing why the scale tool might not be as appropriate as, as our tool, we certainly believe our tool is, is, 
easier to use and um, a heck of a lot better than, um, than what the scale tool offers, we thought the best way to manage it was to actually offer you both. Um, so for any institutions that are gonna be interested in seeing what their reserve might look like under a scale methodology, um, we present the methodology pretty much exactly as the Fed does, but we make it a lot easier to, uh, to use. So if you'll go to the next slide, Sean. Um, the first thing we wanted to look at was, you know, how do they segment the low, what kind of segmentation options do you have under, under scale? And as you can see, it's pretty limited, right? This is the schedule RIC that the larger institutions are starting to fill out now. And it has a total of six, six segments period. So all commercial loans that are not real estate or credit card or other consumer are in one bucket. Um, that's one of the challenges to, uh, to, to utilizing the tool and, and you know, uh, having your examiners and auditors be comfortable with that. Um, next challenge, uh, next slide, Sean. Yep. Next challenge, and this is where I think our tool, our, our, our presentation of the scale model that we're working on is gonna be helpful. Even though the scale tool is really prevent, presented as you know, a really easy, quick way for community banks to comply, that should be very set it and forget it with not a whole lot of work on your end. We, we found after we dug into the details a little bit that it might, it might be a little, it might be somewhat time consuming, honestly, even for you guys to try to comply with scale using the feds tool. And the, the biggest reason I saw um, was because of peer data. If uh, for those of you who are familiar with quick analytics in general, um, you'll notice that one of our big focuses, something that's ubiquitous throughout our entire platform, is access to really good, really comparable apples to apples peer data um, and, and really maximizing the strength of that thicker sample size of peer data, especially from a CECL perspective, in getting much better guidance on, on what loss estimates might be like going forward. Uh, the data that we get from scale, this is a, a snapshot. Um, you know, the Fed said, yes, we will provide that, uh, that reserve data for you to use for scale. Um, uh, every quarter, it'll be on, on the Fed's, a link on the Fed's website. And this is a, a kind of a snapshot of that current spreadsheet that they have out there. So you can see it lists all the institutions in, in the United States that are over, that are between one and $10 billion in assets. Um, there is no geographical information whatsoever in here. Um, you, from this sheet that they give you, you can't figure out where the institutions are located. You can just see their asset size, and their, um, their, um, their reserves and balances for each of those six segments of the portfolio. You'll also notice that in the data that they give, there's no historical loss data, right? We have reserve data and balance data, right? For those six segments for that entire chunk of one to $10 billion institutions. And that's pretty much all you get. Uh, the challenge with that, if you can go to the next slide, Sean, uh, the challenge with that is uh, they they put the the uh, the onus on you guys to to make sure that the peer data you're using is appropriate, but they don't give you the tools with which you could make an appropriate peer group from that data, right? If you want to say I want only banks that are in my state or in my part of the country, um, then unfortunately that the database they gave is is completely unusable and unhelpful and you've got to go mine all that data from the call reports individually yourself, uh, which is something you don't want to spend your time doing. Secondly, there's, uh, there's two areas of a scale tool, as you'll see in just a second when I present an overview of it. There's two areas of a scale tool that use peer data. The first step where we're just using their, their, their reserve levels as a proxy for historical lifetime loss rates and then in the second, um, uh, when we're making an adjustment from our historical experience to the peers. So two separate areas where they ask you to use peer group data. The second area, um, you need to get loss data for the peer group. Unfortunately, the database they provide doesn't have any of that loss data. So you'd have to separately go out into the call reports and whatnot and, and gather all of that 15 years worth of historical loss data on every single bank that is in the peer group that you use for the first section of the scale tool. So once you dig into the details, I think if you wanna use it appropriately or intelligently, and you wanna have 
you know, the same peer data in part one and part two of a scale tool, which seems rational to do, then you're going to have to do actually a lot more work um, than, than, you, um, than it seems that they're presenting you'd have to do in order to get the proper data to implement scale. Um, next slide. So this is the way, uh, this is not the final version yet. We're still developing the tool, but I kind of wanted to give you guys a look at, at, at what it's going to look like. Um, again, it looks very, very much like the, um, I mean, it is the scale tool from the Fed, right? That, that, that Excel um, presentation that they gave, same columns, same segmentation, same data. But instead of you having to go mine the peer data and then go separately calculate other loss rates for the peer group, all that is integrated right off the bat the second that you load up um, the, uh, the scale, the Fed scale tool on our interactive tool. We, uh, we take your loan portfolio, we segment it, we segment it out into those six categories. Even if you don't fill out schedule RIC um, with, with, the, uh, with balances for those six, um, six um, segments, we take your portfolio, we fit it into those buckets, and then we do all the peer data for you, but we allow you to build a custom peer group. Let's say you wanted to not use all the, you know, every one to $10 billion bank in the country as your starting point for your peer group. And you just wanted, you know, a region or a state you can build any peer group you want, and any bank that has that data within the peer group will work. Will be um, filtered directly into into our um, ACL loss rate calculations and into the, um, the uh, adjustment for historical loss experience, which is the Part B of peer data. So we, I think we just we take the scale tool as is. We're not certainly not trying to change that this uh, Fed's methodology. The whole point of this is we're presenting the Fed's solution but we make it a lot easier to use. You can save scenarios, you can compare it side by side with our Cecil Solver tool. You can export the results of this. You can choose custom peer groups without doing any legwork. That's what we wanted to, to, to make it easier um, to utilize. Sean, anything I, I missed on, um, on that part of it? No, I think, you know, I, I just wanna echo and, and you know, kind of reiterate what you pointed out, right? Our real point here was, again, we knew there would be probably questions and some confusion around this tool. And we just decided internally that as Steve said, right, we were just gonna put it out here, right? We felt like there were some, some things we were doing since we were already aggregating data uh, within quick analytics that we could make this tool better. But what we thought you know, could be an option for our users is if you wanted to have a comparative strategy and look at the scale and look at the warm methodology, it couldn't hurt to have that as even further justification for why perhaps you were using our, our warm methodology. So like Steve said, it's, it, the scale wasn't a safe harbor. It was introduced really trying to, again, assist in the um, you know, transition to Cecil. And so again, we just felt like we could be added, additive to our solution by presenting it as a secondary uh, option. And again, I think what Steve laid out here today, he's done a lot of work with our IT team to try to, you know, again, pick out the points where there were certainly gonna be friction points or work required on your part at the bank um, to try to assist it if, you know, if it's an option you want to evaluate. Uh, okay, so we're getting on a lot of questions already. So let me just jump in here. And uh, I think some of these, uh, uh, I think are gonna be, this one's about Q factor. So I'm gonna come back to this one. Um, oh, thank you very much uh, for the kind words, Brad. Let's see, one small item. Would it be possible to print the name of the save scenario in the banner portion of the export results? I think this question has come up before. I think we're working on this. Um, and so I, uh, Steve, did you see that question or can you see? No, I, uh, can you, sorry, let me, um, let me pop that so up So this here. is a question. And would it be possible to print the name of the saved scenario in the banner portion of the export results? So I think this- Oh, the export. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're working on, we're working on that. We, we, um, We've made a couple um, enhancements to the tool. We realize things that are intuitive when you're building it and looking at it interactively on the website, it all needs to, you know, perfectly kind of come out in the in the export um, so that if you have people that you're sharing the export with that weren't watching you when you were building the tool interactively, it's all self-explanatory. So it's a good point. Uh, and then, Bob, we're going to come back to your question because the next section we're going to talk about is Q factors. And, and your question, you know, is there a sense the regulators will have any flexibility in terms of reducing Q factor allocations under the CECL methodology versus the allocation you use pre-CECL? Uh, in order to justify current reserves, we have had to build huge Q factors into the current calculation, a su substantial portion of which we feel now will be captured under CECL. So if we can't reduce that Q factor when we switch over, 
the level uh, of required funding looks extreme. I think you're absolutely right. And this is, I think, one of the reasons why we think it's a good practice to begin running parallel because in fact, yes, you will be able to reduce those Q factors uh, because you are capturing you know, a lot more of, uh, of that history in the life of loan concepts. So yes, the, the, the short answer to your question is you'll be able to redo those, but that's part of, again, what we think is one of the benefits of running a parallel process this year, or at least you know, running a, a CECL scenario uh, you know, in, in 2022 to, again, identify what those will be. But I, I, I do agree you'll probably see a change in those Q factors. Steve, anything you're there? You can... Yeah, I, I think the, the types of Q factors that we want to take into account um, doesn't necessarily have to be very different at all, as Sean is about to, to, to um, you know, extrapolate on. But um, the, the levels of the qualitative factor adjustments, right? At what basis point, what, you know, to what extent we're modifying it is going to be kind of a clean slate, right? Because we're, our starting point is historical lifetime aggregate loss rates over a multi-year period. And the qualitative factor is the adjustment, the plus or the minus to that. So, um, you know, how much you plus or minus is, is 100% dependent upon what that starting point is at an absolute level. So I think we'll have to, completely be reimagining the level of qualitative factor adjustments from an amount standpoint, but not the types of qualitative factor adjustments. Great. Uh, and then there's just a couple of comments in here about uh, the scale tool and not having anything for ag and makes it a challenge as well. So again, the way they segmented it, you know, didn't make it ideal for all, for all community banks. Yeah. And, and of course, you know, our tool is also limited, but it's not limited to six buckets. Uh, we're limited to more like 15 buckets, right? The, uh, all the segments that we have currently on, when you look at, um, you know, your, um, your charge offs, recoveries, past dues, that section of the, of the call report, um, all the segmentation that we can get there is the segmentation we can provide historic, perfect historical apples to apples, long-term uh, data for you and your peers. Um, any segments that we can't get from there uh, will have that same limitation as a scale tool, but um, our we do offer the ability to add custom risk pools. Now, the scale tool allows you to build custom risk pools too, too but makes it almost impossible to, to, to justify or defend or do the calculations, honestly. Um, but uh, we provide the ability to add custom risk pools and pull any of those sub pools that you feel need to be separated out um, from the from the parent um, from the parent bucket to customize it a little bit more. Great. Uh, there's a quick question about uh, loading data, you know, from your uh, AL or trial balance data. Again, we uh, at the CISO solver, since this is all based on call report information, we are loading that every quarter and, and compiling that on your behalf. The only data that we need from you in our CISO solver tool is if you want us to calculate your weighted average remaining maturities uh, in which then we can take a, an upload of a, a file from like uh, FIS bank pack and calculate that on your behalf, whether you give us um, a, um, you know, a flat file or a trial balance or just the, you know, the four fields you need to do to calculate, uh, calculate a warm. So, you know, we can talk to you about that offline if you want, but again, it's uh, the amount of data necessarily or the demands on you are, are pretty, pretty limited. Uh, question, um, uh, we, uh, you know, there's the next question is, is, you know, if we want to talk to you about calculating our warm, yes, you can reach out to Ricky or Melissa or Pam. Um, we can coordinate that. We have a team of people who are working on those. So we're happy to, to assist you with, uh, with those warm calculations. Uh, then there's a question from how will securities held to maturities factor into the scale or other models? Again, I think for the majority of community banks, you know, most of the solutions really have addressed this as much because the fact of the matter is, uh, is for, for the majority of community banks, your securities portfolio uh, is, um, you know, it's, it's guaranteed, right? There's not credit risk. You might have interest rate risk uh, in your portfolio, but you don't have credit risk per se. If you're buying agencies, treasuries, CDs, you know, uh, you know, bank qualified munis. And so it's really not as big of an issue. And so for instance, for us, we, we haven't addressed it uh, yet in our tool just because the primary focus is really on the credit aspect 
of your of your portfolio. Steve, anything you want to add? There? Yeah, I mean the um, and any any CISO adjustment for the securities portfolio is only limited to so the scope of CISO pretty much as it pertains to securities is um, is only for held to maturity securities and only for ones that are not government guaranteed. Um, so right there, we've kind of cut out the vast majority of concern from a securities uh, portfolio, but. Um, certainly at some point, um, if the need arises or becomes a little greater, we can, we can add a, a module to help you um, do some um, estimating on the non-government guaranteed portion of your held and maturity securities portfolio for Cecil. Great. Uh, just a couple of more questions that have come in. Um, if we run the Cecil calculation and there's less than the board wants to set aside for loan losses, can we still set, a, set aside more than the calculation? Again, I think this is where you know, going through it on a trial, uh, on a parallel basis, you know, identifying the, you know, those Q factors that can, you know, substantiate probably a stronger reserve. It's also a situation where, again, I think with Cecil, you have the ability to have that forecasting element where, again, you can build reserves in based on that, you know, potential economic forecast. And then I think as Steve often points out, rightly so, one of the things you can do in our tool is look at different scenarios of warms and see what your best uh, warm period has been or maybe your worst period. And again, that can provide justification why you may want to substantiate more reserves than just the initial calculation. Steve, anything you yeah. want? Yeah. So our tool is very, very well designed for doing exactly that, right? Um, looking uh, a huge part of what those calculations become is going is is subjective right anyone who thinks there's no there's less subjectivity somehow under cecil um there isn't there's if anything cecil is more subjective than the incurred loss methodology we've all been um living under forever and so you know if we're if we're trying to build reserves higher or if we're trying to shave some off of our reserves um, it's very easy to go into the tool and change the look back periods if you're looking for a more um, uh, a, uh, um, a, a historical period that had a higher or lower losses or, or expand that look back period into maybe a more stressful historical time frame. It becomes easier to justify higher higher losses going forward and the qualitative factors right um, we're, we're looking we're estimating losses here um, over the remaining life of the assets going forward. And so we're not going to tell you, our tool doesn't, doesn't even attempt to tell you what your Q factor adjustment should be. Um, what we do is present the best, most defensible data that you can use as much or as little as you see fit, um, take into account in your, in your adjustment. So we'll show you really good peer data as a benchmark, and it's for you to decide how far in the direction of the peer historical loss rate you bring your historical loss rate um, in order to, to, to end up with qualitative factor adjustments that you think make sense for your institution. Because when it comes down to it, and as, as you know, we frequently talk about with, with, with the regulators, is that we're doing all this, but this is all to, for an estimate, right? We're not, there's no perfect calculation here that, that can be justified. It's simply making reasonable assumptions and having some sort of statistically based justification for that. So we provide the statistics needed to, to make those um, assumptions and justify them. Um, and um, it's all about management's best estimate of what you see reading the tea leaves, honestly. Uh, great. A couple more questions. Um, uh, I'm running several scenarios to make sure we're coming away with the proper analysis. Could you explain the QCBI designation for the peer group? So the QCBI is our acronym for Quick Analytics Community Bank Index. So throughout Quick Analytics, one of the distinctions we always wanted to draw or allow our banks to draw was if they wanted to look at just community banks versus the whole bank universe, right? When you see numbers from the FDIC, it includes everybody, but because uh, the, the largest banks are so large, it really just tells a story of what's going on with them. We felt like it was important for community banks to really see an index of true community banks. And so that's what the QCBI uh, distinction really, uh, really touches on is to, um, is to get after that. Um, okay, let me see a couple more questions. Has anyone had any recent FDIC or FDIC or any uh, conversations uh, about Cecil. So I know we've had, you know, we've had banks go through exams. We've had good results. One of the reasons um, on our Cecil Solver page, we have a resources tab where we 
uh, chronicle and list out all the different webinars that the FDIC has done. Uh, the CISO solver was really built uh, upon those presentations. So uh, we are certainly available to meet or discuss. Uh, if, if, if you have a regulator in there that wants to talk about it, but it, you know, uh, we've had no problems you know, so far uh, and don't expect any with uh, neither, either the regulators or any auditors, because again, uh, the, the you know, FASB's weighed in on the methodology uh, as well as, uh, you know, like I said, the FDIC really kind of introduced the way we're doing it. Steve, anything you want to add there? Um, nope. Okay. Uh, all right. I'm going to get to my point eventually, but we got a few more <laughs> questions. Um, it just again, what about non-bank qualified securities? So again, I think this is something that we'll incorporate later in this year. Uh, we just felt like for the majority of community banks, it's not a huge percentage or uh, focus. Uh, so it wouldn't really move the needle all that much. I would say right now you could address that uh, even within your Q factors uh, or even in our page, you could, you know, it, there's a way to add pools uh, and you could put your non-bank qualified and reserve anything you want there. So uh, the, the, the question was submitted anonymously. So, you know, if you want to, we're happy to talk to you about that offline and how you could work within our tool uh, to address those. Um, there's another question here on any way to track ag government and loans to FI separately. We have all three, but only have loss histories for, for the ag. So uh, again, I'll take this real quick and then Steve, you can jump in. So again, much like the non-BQ, we do have the ability for you to segment out different sections within the CECL solver. Um, there is a green button uh, that allows you to add pools. So you can do that. Um, obviously we've tried to you know, stay close to the call reports because it gives us good historical information, but certainly you have the ability to create additional pools. And certainly if you really are looking to go more granular, you know, we can talk to you about our IntelliCredit solution that can allow you to even do that in greater detail. Uh, but Steve, anything you want to add there? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the limitation that we have is, as, as we've you know, said a couple of times is what's available on there. So while we have balances on the call reports going back uh, forever on agricultural production loans and loans to FI and whatnot, what we don't have in the call report record is loss history. So um, unfortunately, based on the call report data, even though we know the balances for you, we don't know what kind of loss experience you've had. Uh, it's not in the public record individually. And so that's where we, you'd use the custom risk pool. Of, certainly there's more legwork um, for you guys in adding the custom risk pools because we don't have, uh, we can't you know, by default just fill in that historical loss history for you automatically. Um, but you can certainly manage it that way within the tool if you need to. The question I would, I would, I would want you to ask yourself though is, we don't want to segment for segment's sake, right? The, 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 there is a very real risk in over-segmentation from, um, from a CECL perspective. I, don't, I think that's a, it's a, that's a point of view you, you probably don't hear or won't hear very much from an examiner or an auditor. Um, but since CECL at its heart is all about looking at long-term historical trends and then extrapolating those trends into the future, we need sample size, right? We need enough loans in our buckets so that we can, we can find some trends in the, in the past that we can extrapolate into the future. And if we over segment, we end up with all these really tiny buckets that they may be very precise. They may seem very accurate, but they are not, they don't lead to, there's no trend analysis that can be done because your loss experience will probably be seven years worth of zeros, one little spike, one little dip, and then four more years worth of zeros. And how can we you know, glean any predictable pattern or trend from that that we can expand into the future, which is what Cecil is asking us to do. So I think it's a, there's a double-edged sword of, of segmentation. So uh, the threshold for when, it, when does it absolutely need to be a separate segment and that I have to do more legwork in calculating it if it's outside the scope of the call report data would be, you know, have, has this separate sub pool had a very different loss experience in the past? than the rest of the pool or do for some reason do i expect it to have a very different loss experience going forward um, if you have two sub pools that have similar loss experience in the past and similar expectations for future performance i would respond with then then from a cecil perspective we don't need to segment them out separately great Thanks. that makes sense more, yeah a couple more questions that continue to come in uh, how do you recommend finding an appropriate prepayment rate to use in the warm calculations. Again, 
you know, this is a this is a tough one, right? Particularly given the interest rate environment we we are certainly finding ourselves in, right? I mean, last year we would have found a much faster prepayment rate in the mortgage portfolio than in one now where we might see interest rates uh, rising. You know, again, uh, the 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 short of it is right. The higher the prepayment rate, the lower the warm. So, you know, we think just starting off with some, you know, measured, uh, you know, numbers, you know, some reasonable assumptions. If you want to go into greater detail, you can do it. But I think for most banks, we haven't found that, you know, uh, you know, spending a whole lot of time trying to be precise about a prepayment rate is is, is probably worth your time and effort. Um, if you want to run some analyses in house and your core allows you to do that very easily, you can certainly do that. You know, but I think some simple assumptions around five to 10 or maybe even mortgages a little bit higher, you know, can be utilized. Steve, anything you want to add there? Yeah, I would say um, in, in our tool, you'll notice um, and we have an Excel file, uh, an Excel template that helps helps do the warm calculations for banks that are doing it internally and not getting help from their core. And, you know, uh, by default, we just have sort of like a 10 percent prepayment rate plugged in there as a placeholder. We feel that that's pretty conservative for most uh, for most loan types, especially in the environment we've been in for a good while now. Um, the problem is there is no really good uh, prepayment industry industry standard prepayment data by segment um, out there um, in the in the ether um, as as it is. Except for there is some data certainly on prepayments for for mortgages because of the whole mortgage backed securities industry. But for most other loan types, we don't really see much there. So it, it was hard for us to provide better, better default values um, than, than what we did. So our suggestion is, you know, start conservative. And uh, if you have better data or you can find some better data, then um, you can maybe get those prepayment rates up higher, which will bring your warm, your remaining maturity averages down, which will uh, typically result in a, in a bit of a, a lower Cecil reserve, right? Since it's all about aggregating losses over the life of the loan, if your duration of your loans is shorter, you're, you're aggregating less losses over time, right? That's, I know that's simplistic view, but John. Okay, thanks. Uh, Bob Hickman, I believe you had a question. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, I think if you're still there, Bob, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still there, but you guys covered the question I had. Okay, great. All right. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna move on now just to, um, the, the, you know, the Q factors, right? I mean, this is the one area where, uh, you know, much like in the incurred loss model, you know, it's the subjective element. Um, you know, again, I think one of the reasons we liked the warm is that there's some, you know, some work we've done in the, over the years to, uh, you know, at our own banks with our own Q factor analysis that, you know, we can incorporate and continue to utilize. Um, so we think that is important. So, you know, certainly the incurred loss, the CECL standard have some differences, right? CECL is looking at a much longer term cyclical approach. You know, the concept of impairment was supposed to go away, but, you know, we're seeing a lot of different things again, uh, particularly around impairment where there's not real uniformity yet. I suspect we'll, we'll, that'll start to clear up here as we, as we move forward. But Q factors are still gonna become and uh, remain a very important piece of this process uh, primarily as you know for most of you have probably been experiencing and can have continued to see just very low loss loss rates in your in your banks which is you know obviously fantastic but uh, all the quantitative measures in the world won't predict losses you know if you haven't had them so we're back to you know understanding the fact that we're still going to have to have some reserve cushion Cecil, the regulators are not going to probably allow us to lower it based on the recent benign experience. And so those Q factors are still going to become, you know, uh, play a critical role here. And I think that's one of the reasons why I think there'll be a little bit of pressure off all of us as we make this transition, because I think the, the you know, the regulators are probably going to look for just trying to maintain, you know, types of balances, you know, that you've seen here over the past few years. You know, uh, all of you, I suspect, use some combination of these common Q factors in terms of changes to policies and procedures and economic and business conditions. Um, I think the big thing, you know, going forward is, again, you've invested in this process. You have a comfort level with this process. Your board, your auditors, your regulators all have uh, a comfort level with this process. And that's a really valuable thing. So let's not discard that. Continue to do the, work, the good work. 
I think our suggestion with Cecil is obviously to add a forward looking, uh, you know, factor to, you know, to allow you to capture like one of the earlier questions uh, suggested, you know, to that of something that might impact your portfolio or if you're looking for a way to substantiate some further from further reserves. Um, obviously, you'll want to recalibrate these Q factors to our new potential pools. Um, and again, as we all know, right, the Q factors are really used to reflect or quantify the risk not captured by historical uh, uh, loss data. Uh, and then finally, I'd say, obviously, since these are subjective, you know, continuing to document your process uh, is important. I'll just make like a kind of an editorial note or a you know, kind of a, a marketing note for next month. We, you know, this is an area where, again, I think is probably the most uh, back and forth or, you know, areas that are open to interpretation. And so next month, we're going to invite, uh, you know, a CPA firm on to join us so they can share their thoughts about the Q factors as well. You know, again, certainly we have our own opinions, but I think, you know, for a lot of you, you may want to hear from auditors as well. And so we've invited uh, a firm on next month. And so we'll touch on this again. Uh, in a little bit uh, greater detail. You know, just as an example, again, how you might recalibrate or use your Q factors, you know, within these different loan pools, you can see just uh, on the screen, you know, a way of kind of rating this. You know, I think, again, we are big believers in being directionally accurate over versus trying to be overly precise, right? That can be a very difficult thing to do. Um, so again, you know, we, we can certainly share ideas on how, you know, what we see uh, in the industry and people, you know, utilizing for this. Um, and again, I think for most of you continuing to do what you're doing uh, today is the right way to go. And again, just maybe add a forward looking element um, to that process. And as we allow you to do in our tool, you know, incorporate potentially even, you know, a peer adjustment um, as, as well. Uh, okay, so just a reminder, everybody seems to be participating very well, but I'm going to leave this screen up here. Steve, anything you want to add here as I look at a few more questions? Um, no, I mean, I, I was just reading the question um, <clears throat> from Kevin, um, um, if you want to, uh, if you want to read that aloud, and then I can um, respond from a timing perspective. Yeah, that's great. Um, all right, so... Uh, so there's a question in regarding timing. So we historically calculate our reserve and need to make provision prior to quarter end with data as of the 15th of the final month. Um, so the bottom line here is you can manually update those totals in our tool, right? That is, uh, you know, that is no problem, particularly, you know, if, you, uh, if you're doing it before the, even the, the quarter end, that's how you can address it. If you're doing the analysis monthly, that's how you address it. Uh, we have made the change or we'll be making the change, you know, much like everything else in quick analytics, when you update your information, your data will be in there in the next day. That will be uh, happening here after the first quarter in the Cecil tool with your numbers. So if you're filing prior to the uh, you know, deadline of the call report, you'll see your quarterly numbers updated. Obviously the peer data, we're always still waiting on till everybody else, um, you know, gets, gets, uh, gets their call reports filed. Um, Steve, anything you want to add there? Yeah, um, so it, it's a good question, certainly, as you think through the implementation of any of these tools from a timing perspective. Um, but as, as Sean mentioned, you can, even though the historical data and the universe of peer data updates on a quarterly basis with a bit of a lag, obviously, due to the call reports being filed, um, it doesn't limit how often you run the tool when you run it as of. You can very easily update the current balances um, column with uh, whatever date you want the, the report to be as of. And um, then sort of a, <clears throat> a follow-up question typically is, well, what happens, are we, are we missing, some, isn't there some lag where we're missing some data there, right? We're running a report as of, um, you know, uh, as of the beginning of May, but we don't have any historical loss data from the industry since uh, from, from March 31st to May 1st. So we're missing April worth of historical loss data. Um, from a data perspective, there's nothing we can do about that because that data unfortunately doesn't exist in the public sphere. However, that's the type of uh, thing that would be managed through our qualitative factors, right? If we have, since it's all about losses and looking at things over a long-term cyclical perspective, 
We're looking at years and years worth of historical data for each segment of your portfolio right up to the last quarter end. And so if there is a month of data, of lost data historically that we don't have, that's not going to have very much of an impact at all on these long-term multi-year trends. <clears throat> and unless it was something extremely significant. And in those cases, if something extremely significant from a loss perspective has happened since the last quarter end and before your, your, your as update, that's something that should be captured within your qualitative factor adjustments because a Q factor, the definition of a Q factor is current and future conditions. If something drastic has changed in your environment in the last 30 days, I would consider that not a part of a long-term historical record, but part of a current conditions adjustment that you can make via Q factors. I hope that helps. Thanks, Steve. Uh, and I want to, you know, thank Barry Kennedy. Uh, you know, we had the question earlier uh, regarding, uh, you know, talking to, to you know, the FDIC, uh, and he offered to one of the other bankers or a couple of the other bankers the ability to discuss, you know, their uh, uh, discussions with them around CISA. So I appreciate uh, all of you kind of coordinating that in the call. Again, that's one of the, the ideas here is we want to, you know, have a community here where, you know, again, we can address these questions um, and, and give you all a forum to not only share uh, information that we, we have, but also that you can share amongst yourselves. So uh, we had another question. I apologize, I didn't announce this at the, the beginning of the webinar. The slide deck will be available. Uh, we'll send that in a link to the recording um, after today's presentation. Uh, it, it may be later today or even Monday, but we will we will get out an email with both of those. All right, uh, Michael, if you can hold one second, I'm going to come find you and allow you to talk here. Um, and you can ask your question. Oops. There we go. All right, Michael, go ahead with your question. Oh, let's see. Maybe I'm trying to get muted here. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. I, I can't hear the question. So um, if you want to submit it through the Q&A, I apologize that uh, it's not it's not working. Q&A or the chat, either way. Or the chat, yeah. And, uh, uh, all right. Let me see if there's any other questions. Uh, again, just a kind of a follow up. Um, again, thank you uh, for all of your participation today. This is wonderful. This is exactly what we had in mind when we started these. Just a reminder, we will have another one of these in March, um, uh, March 11th. And again, at that point, we'll bring in uh, an outside auditing firm. And so again, to give you another perspective uh, around Q factors, because again, I would say this is the one area that kind of continually kind of pops up or you know, of how to best approach this going forward. So we want to share multiple viewpoints, not only our, our own. Um, Steve is going to do a much more in-depth webinar on our CECL solver tool specifically uh, on the 24th at 2 p.m. Eastern. So I certainly encourage you to register for that if you'd like. And then always you can request a demo one-on-one uh, -on -one with, with us, with your data. We'll walk you through it. Uh, and you can do that by emailing us at info at quickrate.com. So uh, on behalf of Steve, all of us here at QuickRate and Quick Analytics, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for taking the time out of your day. I hope you found the presentation helpful. We'll be back next month and uh, hope you have a great weekend. Bye now. Thanks, everybody.